Hello and welcome to the State of the Cat session here at ApacheCon Asia 2022. My name is Mark Thomas and I've been a Tomcat committer since 2003. My day job is at VMware where I have a very simple job description and that is go and do whatever I think is best for Apache Tomcat. So I get to spend the vast majority of my time working on Tomcat. I also contribute over at the Eclipse Foundation where I'm involved in a number of the Jakarta EE specification projects that Tomcat then implements. This session is largely going to be a retrospective over the last 12 months. We'll take a look at the community, take a look at what's been happening for the code, and then I'll go on to look at future plans. So let's start with the community aspect of things. From a numbers perspective, the people side of the community has been fairly static. The number of subscribers to the users list has stayed about the same, as has the number of contributors. Uh, PMC members and committer numbers, they're about the same. In terms of activity, the PMC members are slightly more active than the committers this year, but that's kind of within the noise. It's nothing particularly significant. What I think is of note is that we haven't added any new committers or PMC members this year. This is something I think we need to take a look at for this coming year, because obviously as existing community members um, gain, gain other interests, change jobs, life happens, whatever it may be, they're going to move on at some point. And we need to ensure that there's fresh community members coming in behind. So I think something to look at for this coming year, as I say, is contributors who are prospective committers. In terms of events, we've had two conferences in the last 12 months. We had this conference a year ago, that was ApacheCon Asia 2021. And of course, there's ApacheCon at Home 2021 towards the end of last year. Both of those were virtual and all of the presentations were recorded. You can find the Tomcat presentations, both those conferences and all our previous conferences linked from the Tomcat website. You can also go to YouTube where you can find the full content for both of those conferences. Something else I wanted to mention is that a few years ago, Google gave us $5,000 um, with the caveat it was to do something to improve Tomcat security. Our original idea was what we'd do some sort of security hackathon, but COVID came along and that didn't happen. So we've still got that $5,000 that we need to spend. Now, it doesn't have to be an event, although that's the best idea we've had so far. Um, so if you've got any ideas on what we could do for $5,000 to improve Tomcat security within the bounds of what we can do at the ASF, then please drop a line to the users list, let us know. Um, you know. More ideas are always welcome and failing a better idea, I'm expecting we will arrange some form of security event in the next 12 months. The work on our translations has also continued nicely this year. Uh, that's all done over at poeditor.com who very kindly donate a free uh, account to the Apache Tomcat project. The way we've set it up is anybody can contribute. All you need to do is create yourself an account on poeditor.com and then you can contribute towards the Tomcat translations. We've got a number of languages that are already at 100% um, translations and the other languages have all seen a sort of small percentage points improvements this year. It's a really easy way to contribute to Tomcat so if you're looking for a way to get involved and you want an easy start, then I highly recommend you have a look at the translations. So let's go on to have a look at what's been happening in the code this year. I think it's useful to start sort of with an overview and remind people that we have four Tomcat releases currently being released. That's 8.5, which supports Java EE7, uh, 9.0, which is Java EE8, also known as Jakarta EE8, Tomcat 10.0, that's Jakarta EE9, which is the one where all the packages were renamed. So that's where everything changed from Java X dot something to Jakarta dot something. And we're currently got Tomcat 10.1 in beta, and that implements Jakarta EE10. I will point out that once Tomcat 10.1 becomes stable, we are going to stop releases of Tomcat 10, and that will get us back to our default position of three major versions being released in parallel. We do aim to do a release once a month of each of those supported versions. We've done reasonably well over the last year. We've had four supported versions, and we've had monthly releases for all of them apart from one month. Um, that was December for Tomcat 8.5, and that was a combination of 
holidays, the release manager being busy, there not being a huge amount of um, new functionality in that in 8.5 at the time, and just the timing of when, when the, the code was ready to be released, we ended up skipping the December release for 8.5, but otherwise monthly releases. It's also worth pointing out that when we do those monthly releases, we always re re fix all open bugs that we know about in Tomcat before we do that release. Not enhancement requests, but bugs. So if you do have a bug and you report it to us, it should be fixed for the release at the beginning of the next month. You'll notice on the right-hand side of the chart, those three dots, that's to signify that releases are planned for July, but at the time I recorded this, those releases hadn't actually been completed. Looking a bit further down, you can see that we had one release for the migration tool for Jakarta EE this year. Uh, that was just a small bug fix release that we did this month. ModJK, on the other hand, hasn't had any releases at all. And that's because ModJK is fairly stable these days. Uh, there's not a huge amount um, happening there that would cause us to make a release. Having said that, Rayner has been working on um, implementing the unique request identifier functionality and linking that up from HTTPD into ModJK. And given that that work, I believe, is complete, I think it's fair to say we can expect a ModJK release fairly soon. The Tomcat native 1.2 releases, we've had four, hopefully five by the time that you're watching this. And those releases are all driven by OpenSSL releases. One of the things that we include in our Tomcat native release is the Windows binaries. And when OpenSSL has a security vulnerability, then we need to update the Windows binaries because they include OpenSSL, and that triggers a, a, a Tomcat native 1.2 release. We have just started uh, the Tomcat Native 2 stream, and I'll talk a little bit about those in a bit. In terms of notable new features this year, I think the obvious thing is Jakarta EE10 that's been introduced in Tomcat 10.1, and I'll expand on that too in a couple of slides time. Other things that I think are worthy of mention, having read through the change log, uh, Remy has been working on experimental support for OpenSSL via the Panama API. That's a new feature in Java that lets you take a native library and wrap it and then use that library just with Java code. It essentially removes the need to use JNI to write native code. And it's what we think is the future of OpenSSL integration with Tomcat, and it will eventually replace the uh, Tomcat native project. Uh, we've added custom resource strategies to for um, resource caching strategies for static resources. So if you've got static resources that you want, you don't want a single cache, caching strategy for all of them, you can now implement your own caching strategy and tailor it as you wish. We've continued to expand support for different key and certificate formats. Uh, we're not up to the range of support that OpenSSL offers, but I think we've got all the major ones cover, covered and quite a few of the less popular ones. But I think there's always going to be just a few edge cases that you'll need to convert with OpenSSL first. And finally, in terms of notable new features, if you use Kubernetes, you can now configure to your Tomcat instance via service binding. That then connects to a Tomcat property source, which will do replacement into the configuration files like server.xml, context.xml, and so on. In terms of notable bugs this year, we haven't really had a notable Tomcat bug, but we have had a notable bug that has impacted the project. And that's what we call the Linux kernel duplicate accept bug. Now, this is a really nice example of excellent open source community effort. And it started with a really good bug report from Daniel RA to the Spring MVC team. The bug that Daniel had found was hard to reproduce um, very infrequent, but he managed to put together a test case that reproduced it often enough that you could investigate it. So the Spring MVC team took a look and then they got me involved because it, there were issues around error handling with asynchronous requests. And we had a little bit of back and forth between me and the Spring team. They fixed some Spring MVC bugs. I fixed it to a couple of Tomcat bugs. We sent it back to Daniel saying, we think we fixed it. And Daniel would tweak his test case and say, ah, actually, no, I found another way of triggering it. And that went back and forth a few times until we got to the point where we'd fixed all of the spring bugs and all of the Tomcat bugs. But we were still having an issue. And when I dug into the code, what I find, found what was happening 
was at the network level, a single request was being received, but Tomcat was seeing two requests. And as far as Tomcat was concerned, they were completely separate request objects, but they actually pointed to the same network connection. So if you imagine two packets arrive, the first packet gets handled by the first, um, gets handled by Tomcat in the first request, that's fine. Then the second packet arrives. If Tomcat handles that as the first packet of the second request, then things get very messy very quickly because it won't look like the start of a new request because it will be the middle of the, the other request. So because you've got this actually one network connection, but Tomcat sees it as two separate requests and two threads are trying to process it, things get very messy very quickly. What we were able to do was take that test case and pass that on to the OpenJDK team. They worked really, really quickly, did a fabulous job, very soon identified that it wasn't actually a JDK problem, it was happening at the operating system level. And they actually went one step further and provided a little, little C test case that demonstrated the issue that didn't go anywhere near Java. And with that, we were able to report the bug to the Ubuntu team. The reason I reported it to Ubuntu, not directly to Linux, was I could only see the issue on Ubuntu. I didn't have any other OSs to test, so I thought it best to go through the proper channels. That's where things stalled a little bit. Um, I tried a few things via contacts at work and contacts via the ASF to try and nudge things towards progress. And we also, in Tomcat, put in some code to detect when the bug happened and then generate an error message that pointed people towards that Ubuntu bug report. The idea being that the more people that said on there, yes, I'm affected too, then the greater the visibility of the report would get. Now, I'm not sure what, if any, of those efforts actually contributed to increasing the visibility of the report, but at some point, uh, the Linux kernel team found the bug and fixed it. Now, that was completely unknown to us because the Ubuntu bug wasn't updated at all, but uh, Christopher did a little bit more research and he was able to identify that the problem was fixed and managed to find the uh, Linux kernel commit that fixed it. So we were able to tie everything up. So overall, a really good community effort, something that one of us on our own couldn't have progressed it anywhere near as well. But by working together, we were able to get to the bottom of what was a very nasty little bug. Uh, other things that have been happening this year, uh, done some work on repro re reproducible builds. Again, more on that in a second. Uh, for code coverage, we've switched to using Jococo. And the reason we've done that is that Curvature isn't supported on Java 11, so we had to switch. That then triggered um, updating all versions to use Jococo. And in the end, we actually switched all versions to building with Java 11 as well. Tomcat 8 still has a minimum runtime for Java 7, but we just build it with Java 11 by default. An unexpected benefit of switching to, to Jococo was that we could now run the code coverage multi-threaded. Previously, we had to run it in a single thread, which meant it took well over an hour to run. Now, because Jococo can do it multi-threaded, it adds about 50% to the runtime, which isn't too bad. It means a full test suite takes about 15 minutes on, on my computer. Another change we've made is we've switched to using JSign to manage our signing of Windows binaries. The ASF has a code signing service from DigiCert called DigiCert One, and normally you'd use DigiCert's uh, platform-specific tools to do that signing. But by switching to JSign, which was actually a, a side effect of the reproducible build work we did, it meant we got a platform-independent way to do the signing that didn't need any additional software to be installed, which was really nice. And finally, we've switched the Tomcat build to use the dependencies from the ASF CDN rather than the archive server. That's just to try and bring the load on the archive server down a bit. So I mentioned uh, Jakarta EE10 as one of the big changes in the last year, and that's all implemented in Tomcat 10.1. So an obvious change is that the minimum Java version is now Java 11. That's let us do a few things with the Tomcat internals because we can now use Java 11 features. Probably the biggest change throughout the Jakarta EE10 API is that deprecated code has been removed. Well, nearly all of it has been removed. And some of that code was deprecated 20 years ago when I first started using Tomcat. And it's taken that long to actually clean it out. So with Jakarta EE10, all of that depre well, nearly all of that deprecated code is cleaned out and the bits that are left, I'm expecting to be cleaned out in Jakarta EE11. Now, if we look at the individual specifications that Tomcat implements, for servlet, I think the biggest change is the clarifying of the behavior around URI handling. We've seen over the past 
few years, various security issues to do with decoding and normalization around security constraints, filter mapping, reverse proxying. And what we tried to do in this release of the servlet spec is to clarify how we expect the servlet container to behave. We've also specified, um, and this was an idea of uh, Greg Wilkins from the Jetty Project, a number of suspicious URIs that we really don't ever expect to see. They're technically correct, and yeah, the container could respond to them, but 99 times out of 100, they're actually somebody trying to do something malicious. And those patterns, it is now strongly recommended that servlet containers reject by default, and that's what Tomcat does. Uh, cookies, that, that's all been updated to reference the 6265 RFC. So we're now, uh, the servlet spec is now using the updated cookie specifications. And in terms of new features, I think worth mentioning the uh, request and connection identifiers are now available through, through the API. That's to help with debugging and fault finding. For JSPs, I think that the notable change there is the handling of uh, unknown identifiers. Now, if you have a JSP that uses EL and it has an identifier and you miss, you put a typo in the identifier, you misspell it. JSP will treat that unknown identifier just as null. And because it's in EL, EL, the null will almost certainly just get coerced to an empty string, which then makes it very hard to figure out what actually went wrong. What we've added for this release of the specification is a page directive that lets you trigger an exception if an unknown identifier is found. It should help, help tracking down those issues a lot easier. Um, JSP plugin, that feature has been deprecated primarily because the browser functionality that it depends on has been removed from the browsers for a number of years. So there's no point in the functionality existing in JSP. So that's been deprecated and will be removed in the next release. In terms of expression language, really the changes there are all around making it a little bit easier to use. So the Bean EL resolver that follows the Java Bean specification, we've added something to that that says, oh, and support default methods as well, because default methods aren't actually in the Java Bean specification and they'd otherwise be ignored. Um, and that's usually quite an unexpected behavior. So we've added the default method support to help things users there. Uh, we've added the ability to coerce a Lambda expression to a functional interface invocation, and we've added array coercion. So if you've got a method that takes an array of ints and you pass it an array of strings, each element in that array will be coerced to an int, and then the resulting array of ints passed to the method. For WebSocket, I think the significant change is the ability to configure TLS for the client side API. The way that's been implemented is you pass in a configured SSL context. The reason we did it like that is by passing in an SSL context instance, it means when new methods are added to that to the SSL context API to represent new TLS features, you'll still be able to use them immediately with WebSocket. So it gives us a degree of future proofing. Uh, we've removed the restriction that prevented deployment of endpoints apart from a web application start. That's primarily going to be of interest to frameworks because they can now deploy WebSocket endpoints uh, at any point during the web application lifecycle. In terms of packaging, it used to be the case that there were two jars, a client jar that had all of the client classes and a server jar that had the server and the client classes in it. That doesn't work very well with the Java platform module system. So to improve that for this release, what we've done is the client jar stayed the same. It's just got the client jars in it. The server jar now just has the server classes in it and the server jar depends on the client jar. So it picks, it up, picks up those classes that way. That then works nicely with the module system. I mentioned reproducible builds. I'll just expand on this a little bit here. I've actually got an entire session on this elsewhere in the conference. And if it's something that interests you, I encourage you to go and look at that session. As of now, Tomcat releases for all supported branches are reproducible. That means that if you take a Tomcat source distribution and use the same version of Java and the same version of Ant to build it as the release manager did, you'll end up with a release distribution that is bit for bit binary identical to the one that's available from the Tomcat, uh, from the Apache servers. And what that allows is validation of binaries. So very quickly, if I build it from source, and produce the binaries, you've got no real way to check that those binaries are really built from the source and I haven't um, manipulated them some way. If several people can all build the same binaries from, from the source, then you know that those binaries have truly been built from that source and haven't been manipulated. So it's all about um, improving the validation of the binaries. 
Also said I'd expand on Tomcat Native. So talk about Tomcat Native 1.2 first. That has a minimum version of OpenSSL 102. That's because a number of the Linux distributions until very recently, that was the version of OpenSSL that they were based on. So in order to maintain support with those Linux distributions, uh, Tomcat Native has a minimum version of OpenSSL 102. Tomcat Native 1.2 also provides support for the API uh, native connector. That's the connector that use, is the Apache APR library to perform the network IO to the client and OpenSSL to perform the TLS encryption and decryption. In Tomcat Native 2, we're moving away from that. We've removed support for the APR native library and now we use Java to do the network IO, but we still use OpenSSL to do the TLS encryption and decryption. We also took the opportunity to update the minimum OpenSSL version. So that's now OpenSSL 3 for Tomcat Native 2. What's worth noting there is OpenSSL 3 has a much simpler way to enable FIPS. So once the OpenSSL 3 FIPS module is certified, you'll be able to have a FIPS certified TLS implementation for use with Tomcat, and that should be fairly simple to, to take advantage of. As I mentioned before, the long-term plan for this is to use Project Panama, and that will replace the Tomcat native connector completely. And if you want to look at that in more detail, then I'd point you towards the modules that are available in the Tomcat 10.1 source. OpenJDK has been continuing its six monthly release cycle um, over the last year. So Java 16 reached end of life. We've got the long-term support of Java 17, and we're currently on Java 18. There's actually two early access releases available at the moment, one for 19 and one for 20. Now, because Tomcat has to work on the minimum Java version specified by the Jakarta EE spec, we actually do the building of Tomcat way back on Java 11. And remember I said Tomcat 8 will actually run on Java 7. So whilst we use Java 11, we're also for Tomcat 10, we're limited, so Tomcat 10 1, we're limited to Java 11 features. We can't take advantage of the new features that are available in these newer versions of Java. But what we do do is that we test Tomcat with those versions to ensure that it will work. And we test it with the early access versions as well. So you can be sure that by the time um, a Java uh, version reaches full release, then Tomcat will work with it. And we will happily support Tomcat on any, any released version of Java. We actually have in Tomcat a couple of places where we have some optimizations and they're based on exactly which classes are present in the Java runtime. So to ensure that we catch any cases of new classes appearing, then we have some unit tests that look for that. And we caught some of those when um, the Java 19 early access came out and that's already been taken care of. And so when you, want to, when you do want to use a new version of Java, you can be sure that Tomcat will work with it quite happily. Securities. Um, a bit like bugs has been a fairly quiet year. We've had some issues. Um, some of them have been of reasonable severity. But there's nothing that really stands out. When I think of security issues that stand out in the last year, the obvious one is the log for shell vulnerability. And it is worth pointing out that Tomcat is not affected by that at all. We don't use log for J, so Tomcat was completely, totally and utterly unaffected. That said, it's quite likely that web applications that run on Tomcat will use Log4j and those would be affected. So if you're in that boat, if you haven't already and you really should have done, please make sure you've done the necessary updates. So that's sort of what's happened over the last 12 months. Let's go on to talk a little bit about future plans. And I'm actually going to start, perhaps surprisingly, with Tomcat 9. Now, it might, might seem odd to start with a slightly older Tomcat version, but the reason I'm starting with Tomcat 9 is Tomcat 9 is the last version that supports Java EE. And what we have said and what we continue to say is that there will be a version of Tomcat that supports Java EE for as long as there is a demand from the users. Now, exactly how we do that um, is likely to um, change over time, simply because the point where we need to do something different is so far away. So Tomcat 9 is going to be supported and normally I expect it to be supported for another five years. So anything that happens is at least five years away. If we then continue to support Tomcat 9 as the easiest way to provide a Java EE version, then that gets us to eight years away until Tomcat 10 reaches end of life. And only then does something interesting perhaps happen. So we're looking 
eight years down the line, um, our thinking now may well evolve over that time frame. So what I'm trying to give is an idea of the sort of thing we're likely to do, but please don't take this as a guarantee as this is what we're going to do in eight years time because all sorts of things could have changed. That said, the fundamental promise is unchanged. There will be a Tomcat version that will support Java EE. Exactly what it looked like looks like, we'll see. But a possible plan is that Tomcat 10 reaches end of life. Um, we want to retain the Java EE8 API. So we could either um, backport all the Tomcat 10 changes into Tomcat 9, call it Tomcat 9.10, or we could start with Tomcat 10, change the um, APIs back to the Java EE versions and call that Tomcat 9.10. Don't know. It could be one of those. It could be something a bit different. We shall see. But assuming we do something like that, then a bit further down the line, when Tomcat 11 reaches end, end of life, then we'll do a similar thing and we'll have Tomcat 9.11 and so on. And we'll continue with Tomcat 9.12, 9.13, up until the point where uh, there just really isn't a demand for that that functionality from the community. Now, talking of Tomcat 11, and this is how far ahead we were talking on that previous slide, we haven't even started work on Tomcat 11 yet. So Tomcat 11 will implement Jakarta EE 11, and work on Jakarta EE 11 is due to start later this year. And um, essentially once the Jakarta EE 10 work wraps up, then I'm expecting there'll be a short break and then Jakarta EE 11 work will start. And I'll dig into that a little bit more in a few slides time. But outside of Jakarta EE, we don't have any particular plans for significant changes at this point. Um, we're not planning on implementing Quick. Uh, if we did, that would probably need some form of native library. So I'm not exactly sure how we do that. Um, but if, if there's demand for Quick, then that's certainly something we can look at. Timescales for Tomcat 11, very much TBD. Best guess about two years away. So middle of 2024. And Tomcat 8.5 will end of life at the same time. And as always, we will give you 12 months notice before we end of life Tomcat 8.5. So because Tomcat 11 is that two years away, there's plenty of opportunity for um, ideas around significant changes to happen between now and then. And I'm sure there will be some. In terms of Jakarta EE 11, I'm expecting the security manage, manager to be removed. Um, it's already deprecated in Java runtime. Um, there was talk of maybe removing bits of it in Jakarta EE 10, but I don't think anything happened. So I think J Jakarta EE 11 is where the security manager is going to get removed. And sent, there's several reasons for that. And the platform's removing it because it's actually really hard to maintain. From a Jakarta EE point of view, um, whilst if I look back in the history, there was an expectation that everything would go multi-tenant. You'd have one big Java EE or Jakarta EE container that would then have multiple customers, multiple tenants, all using it at the same time. That's not really what's happened. Everything's really gone towards containers and each tenant has their own container and you achieve separation that way. Whereas in the multi-tenant environment, the security manager offered some benefits in a container environment, you don't really need it to enforce that separation. So I can see it being, being removed. Other things that I'm expecting to happen in terms of the servlet spec, mostly clarifications. There's lots of areas that um, are not as clear and as well-defined as we would like in the servlet spec, particularly around asynchronous and error handling. So I'm expecting there to be a lot of clarifications there. It is unlikely that all of the areas that need clarification are going to be addressed. There's a, over 100 open issues the last time I checked the servlet spec. What I am hoping is that the majority of them will be addressed. Uh, for WebSocket, it's looking like a few enhancements, a few extra features, simplify the API in a few places, some clarifications. There are a couple of fundamental questions there that still need bottoming out, mainly to do with when you have an HTTP request that upgrades to WebSocket, to what extent do you retain a connection between the two, particularly the HTTP session, um, and to what extent are they completely separate? So I think uh, more discussion is due around that, and we may see some movement on WebSocket in that area. Uh, for the pages specification, that's JSPs, that's a very, very stable specification. I'm not really expecting anything new there. Um, 
unless something crops up in one of the other specs that triggers some clarification being required in pages. What I'm expecting is some of the code that's been deprecated for a long time in pages that should have been removed in Jakarta EE 10 and wasn't. I'm expecting that to be removed in Jakarta EE 11. For expression language, there I think the notable change is again is removal of deprecated code. That's to remove a dependency between EL and the Java desktop module. And that's to help people that are using EL in a modularized environment. The reason for that is pulling in Java desktop is a really big dependency to pull in and you don't really need it for expression language. So we're gonna remove the deprecated code, which will enable to get, get us to get rid of that dependency. And then like uh, WebSocket, there's a small number of enhancements as well. One possibility that has been discussed is combining the Jakarta authentication specification with the Jakarta authorization specification. If that happens, then as Tomcat implements Jakarta authentication, then I'd expect there to be some work to implement the authorization side of things as well. Uh, finally, I want to talk about ways to contribute to Tomcat. Lots of different ways. Um, first of all, you know, join the mailing lists, uh, ask questions. If you're able to answer questions, then please do so. Bug reports, that's another really good way to contribute to Tomcat. If there's something that's causing a problem and you can create a reproducible bug report, please do open a Bugzilla issue, attach your test case and tell us all about it. As you'll remember earlier, we do close all open bug reports before we do a release. So if you open a bug report now, then that should be fixed by the um, August releases. Translations, I mentioned how easy that was to get involved in earlier. Um, release candidate testing, that's another good one. We have seen rather frustratingly a few times where we do our release process and we, we have to allow th normally three, three whole days for voting to give everybody a chance to test it. So we have a three day voting period. We come to the end, it all looks good. We do the admin to close the vote and formally release the version. And then within about an hour of doing that, we'll see an email saying, oh, I've just downloaded it and tested it. And I found this bug. And it, yeah, if only you could have found that while we were doing the vote, we could have stopped the vote then, fixed it, redone the release and started again. And it would have saved us a huge amount of time. So if you are able to test release candidates, please do sign up to the dev list, watch out for the vote threads. And when you see them, download that version, pop it in your test environment and run your tests and let us know if you find a problem. It'd be really, really helpful. Now, if you're looking for a bit more of a challenge, you want um, a, a larger project to take on, then there's the Tomcat Maven plugin. And that plugin is designed to let users who are developing web applications in Maven then actually run them on Tomcat as part of their development environment. Now that plugin hasn't seen very much activity for quite a while. Uh, there are quite a few open issues that need fixing. It needs updating to support the latest Tomcat versions. But if that's something you'd like to get involved in, then please contact the dev list. I'll be more than happy to provide you some pointers to get you started. But as a minimum, please join the users list, follow, follow along there, ask any questions you've got and, and answer the ones when you can. That would be great. And with that, that brings me to the end of this session. Thank you very much for your attention.